This lecture, I'm going to talk about the clade deuterostomia. It's part of the animal group uh, in the bilateriate group. And uh, let's just first get you again to where we are in the animal phylogeny. I'm just going to draw an abbreviated version of this. Uh, we did do a more extensive version either in class or in another lecture, so you'll need to know that. But um, for our purposes, I'm going to put periphera on there. Remember, that's the sponges. And then I'm just going to jump to cnidaria. Those are things like jellies and sea anemones, sea fans, um, hydra, and so forth. And that's the sister clade to the bilateria group, which would then you'd be these. There, that's the last common ancestor of all bilateriates. Then we have two groups we talked about already, the um, ecdysozoans, and then the spiralia, also probably called the lophotrochozoa. And then the group that we're looking at now, deuterostomia. And just note that there are organisms in the Spiralia lophotrochozoa group that do have deuterostomy type development, but uh, the deuterostomia do uh, as well. And so that's where we're looking. In deuterostome type development or deuterostomy, there's a number of characteristics. One characteristic I'm showing here is that if you have four cell stage, Not the most beautiful drawing ever, but it's a little difficult to draw on my iPad with my stylus. Okay, so you have four cells here, and you take one of those cells out. And then you have the other three cells left. Uh, each of those, this single cell, can actually go on to develop an entire organism, and these three leftover cells can develop an entire organism. So what that means is that the cells are not so far in their differentiation or specific identity that they can't replace them. So basically those cells, this one and these three, can still turn into any cell type. And so we call that indeterminate development. Now eventually you can't do this. Um, the cells will be specialized too far, but at the beginning this is possible. So that is your indeterminate development. Okay, that there is indeterminate development. Another characteristic is how the cells split during early development. So here's a four cell stage again. And in deuterostome type development, the spindles are going to line up in this sort of orientation. So basically here's the axis of the embryo and the spindles line up along that axis. And they will divide Of course, in the back, there's one um, behind as well. So in the eight cell stage, you have an embryo that looks like this. Okay, then the next round of division, the spindles line up the perpendicular to last time and perpendicular to the axis um, that goes up and down. So they're lining up this direction, which means that the cells will split in that direction. There's eight. Of course, these are connected, and there's some behind it. Uh, and then the next round, you'd have them split again this way, and so forth for a number of rounds of division. So we actually call that type of cleavage radial cleavage. 
and eventually these cells uh, divide enough to turn into this hollow ball of cells. There's many more cells than this, and this is a cut through, by the way, um, so it's really a sphere with a, with a cavity in the middle, but we call this the blastula. And I'm just gonna represent it like this, and the blastula then uh, starts folding inward during gastrulation. That part here is called the blastopore. Okay, so that blastopore, um, during this gastrulation, the cells start to become specified, meaning they have particular identities. So one of those is the ectoderm, one of those is the endoderm. And the third, because these are triploblasts, is the mesoderm, and that's where the difference between protostomy and deuterostomy takes place. In the deuterostomy type development, our mesoderm comes from these outpouches of the endoderm. And eventually those will split off and the endoderm will make its tube, and then the ectoderm's here, and soon thereafter, we'll have the endoderm making the gut tube, and then the ectoderm on the outside, and then the mesoderm in deuterostomia type development lines the uh, endoderm and ectoderm but it comes from these pouches. That's the difference there. And finally, we'll look at the fate of the blastopore. And just recall, it's actually more like you have a balloon and you're poking your finger into the bottom of the balloon. So it's, that's the kind of um, structure that's forming. And so we're going to look at what we call the fate of the blastopore. So eventually this part you saw me drawing this before, turns into a full gut tube. Basically, it goes all the way up and attaches to the other side. And the second side is the mouth. That's where deutero, meaning two, or second, deuterostome, stome meaning mouth. So that's the mouth, and the first opening where the blastopore was turns into the anus of the complete digestive system. So those are the differences and specialties of the deuterostomy type development, which is what we see in deuterostomia. Within deuterostomia, there are three major groups. We have the chordates or chordata phylum that we will look at in a different lecture. And then we have the echinodermata and the hemichordata. Those are the two that we will be looking at right now. First of those two phyla we will look at is the echinodermata. So let's look at that word. Echino means spiny, and derma means skin, like a dermatologist. So that's where this phylum gets its name. These organisms are all marine, meaning they live in salt water, like the ocean. Some live in more brackish water occasionally, so that's like a little less salty, but primarily in the ocean. They're slow moving or sessile. What that means is that they don't move at all. They're attached to their substrate, at least as an adult. If you've ever seen a sea star creep along, you know that it takes a while for them to get anywhere. Body plan is kind of interesting. So they are in the bilateria phylum, and that's because during uh, larval stages, they are bilaterally symmetri symmetrical. So you can see here very clearly this brittle star larvae if you could split it like that, that's the only direction that you get two mirror images. If you split it on this direction or this direction, it's not mirror images. So that's the, the bilateral symmetry. Same with the sea urchin larvae, and then here's the sea star larvae. You might be surprised that this kind of larva turns into this kind of adult. And a uh, sea urchin larva turns into this kind of adult. They actually undergo metamorphosis. And uh, they're radially symmetrical. So you see with the sea star that you could cut it here or here or here. Um, and then the urchin, obviously, many planes you could cut it in to make them um, mirror images. So that's radial symmetry. 
And we can see that bilateral symmetry of a starfish larva on this really awesome site. It's called Small World in, in Motion, and there's also a photography competition. It's put on by Nikon, and you could look it up online, and they also have a YouTube channel. This video is out of Stanford University, and we're looking at an eight-week-old starfish larva, and you're going to see that it creates these vortices in the water that it lives in uh, in order to sweep the algae that it eats towards itself. It's very clear the bilateral symmetry here. And it's a really beautiful movie. And then deuterostome type development, and here's the starfish blastula. You can see here's the blastopore. So that eventually will become the anus, and then the other side will be the mouth. The previous characteristics are not unique of echinoderms. So the synapomorphies or derived characters of echinoderms are as follows. So they have an endoskeleton, which in itself is not unique. We have an endoskeleton. But theirs is made of these calcareous plates, so basically calcium embedded plates underneath this thin skin. And you'll see that in the next picture more clearly. And just to point out that endo means inside skeleton instead of something like exoskeleton meaning outside. Another synapomorphy is this water vascular system, which is quite unique. Uh, and it consists of these canals and then these uh, tube feet underneath. You'll see those um, in these pictures. So here are the tube feet. This is the oral side or the underside of the starfish. There's the mouth. So these are tube feet. And here are tube feet as well. And this starfish, or sea star, is actually sticking to the side of an aquarium. So pretty much they use these tube feet and this water vascular system by changing the water pressure and are able to use it as suction cups. It allows them to move in many cases as well as to stick to surfaces, um, like in a tide pool on a rock, let's say, or the side of an aquarium, and also to be able to pry open um, their prey. I just want to point out that this is a time-lapse movie, which means that it's sped up. Uh, sea stars don't move quite this fast, but it allows you to see the process. Like an advancing army, the sea stars move into position, slowly but surely working their way up toward their victims. The muscles cannot run or fight. All they can do is hide within their shells as their killers crawl over their bodies. Sensory tube feet sweep over the tightly packed mass of shells, searching for any gap in the muscle's defenses. Settling on its victim, the sea star hunkers down and begins its attack. The miniature camera tucked within the muscle shell gives us the first look ever at the carnage that unfolds here every day. Once the tube feet have physically breached the muscle's defensive line, the sea star's translucent stomach begins the final assault. The animal actually pushes its stomach inside the muscle's shell, unfolding like a fatal flower. The stomach unleashes a volley of chemical weapons, digestive juices that dissolve the muscle's soft pink flesh. All that's left is a nutrient-rich soup, a broth that's quickly absorbed by the sea star. Having assimilated the muscle, the sea star stomach pulls away and the animal moves on, leaving behind an empty shell. Without the benefit of speed, brains, or brawn, sea stars are amazingly successful predators.
This is a model and a pretty drawing of a sea star example of a echinoderm. So again, here are, um, is this ring canal and then the water vascular system. So we have these uh, canals here. These are the ampullae, so you can see in this cutaway as well. They sort of remind me of the bulb of a dropper and they go down into the suction cup at the bottom. So this whole thing is the tube foot and you can see these are the tube feet, the suction cup parts underneath the oral side. There's the mouth. And that is attached to the stomach, which you can see in green here. On the other side is the anus. So that would be sticking out the uh, arboreal or top side of the sea star. Then we have digestive glands. Every uh, limb or arm gets its own digestive glands. That's the digestive system, basically. Then we have gonads. You can see them here. Each arm has its own set of gonads and this cutaway. And that's, of course, for egg and sperm production. And then this is a nice view of the endoder or endoskeleton part. So here is the calcareous plate. And then this gray part here is the skin. Of course, these body parts are oriented somewhat differently in the different types of echinoderms, but this gives you a basic idea. The last relatively unique characteristic is this ability to regenerate lost arms and species that have them. I say relatively unique because there are other animals that can do this, like some types of newts. Um, and so we study all those types of organisms to see how they can reconstruct all the tissue types and organs in, let's say, an arm. Or if you just have an arm and part of the central body, how do you make the rest of the body? And basically, in the end, that means they're studying some cell populations that are reactivated upon this fragmentation and then can differentiate. And the idea there is if we could figure out how to activate maybe stem cell populations in our own bodies, we could potentially regrow limbs or something like that. I'm not sure that's entirely feasible, but um, that would be what we're kind of aiming towards. There's actually an interesting story about fragmentation, which is a type of asexual reproduction. Uh, these usually sexually reproduce. But there were these oyster farmers that were trying to get rid of the sea stars because they were eating all their oysters. And so what they did was they would catch them and then cut them up into pieces and throw them back into the water. And what that ended up doing actually is making the sea star population explode because each one that's cut up would usually turn into its own new organism. So if you cut off one arm and part of the central body, you'd end up with two sea stars instead of one. So obviously because they didn't understand the biology of the sea star, they ended up causing a major problem for themselves instead of fixing their issue. One interesting thing about starfish is their incredible ability to regenerate lost limbs. Here is a starfish from the genus Fromia. We took him in as a rescue having lost all but one arm. Since then, this little guy regrew five arms and is starting to look like, kind of like a little hand. Starfish do not have a centralized brain, but they do have very complex nervous systems. They are able to sense what they touch with their feet, as well as detect light from the tips of their arms. Because they have, in essence, a distributed neural network, starfish cannot plan actions in advance. They respond to stimuli, and the arm that is first to detect something becomes dominant and overrides the other arms. Now we'll look at five classes of echinoderms. Sometimes I see it split into six with the sea daisies as their own class. Sometimes I see those under uh, Asteroidea. I'm just going to talk about five. And just to remind you, phylum, echinodermata, and these are five classes. Uh, what I'd ask you to do is mostly to match characteristics with the different classes. The first class is probably what you're familiar with, the sea star class. Um, aster meaning star, so asteroid, star, um, and so you can remember that from the word. They have the central disc with five or more arms, so you may think that sea stars all have five arms, because many of them do, but that's not true. This one has ten arms. Uh, this one has probably also ten arms or maybe more. And uh, you can see some of them are beautiful colors, probably warding off predators. Other ones are blending in with the environment. Of course, not the aquarium, but that would be on a rock or sand area would be blending in. They have tube feet on their oral side for locomotion and, as we saw, for eating as well. And for these, you're going to see uh, that the central disc is continuous with the arms. 
So you can't really distinguish the central disc from the arms. On the other hand, this class Ophiuroidea, uh, Ophis means snake-like, that's not that useful for remembering, but Ophiuroidea are the brittle stars. And you can see that the central disc here is actually quite distinguishable from the arms, unlike the Asteroidea. So I'd draw it in my notes. Something like this. The arms are also much skinnier and they do help it move. Um, they don't have suckers on the tube feet, but they do have tube feet like all echinoderms. And this is that brittle star. It, and here's a basket star. So those uh, arms are actually just attached together. It's really quite a beautiful organism. Look at him. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? If you have live rock in your tank, there's a decent chance that you have these little guys living in it. These are brittle stars, which are great detritivores, feeding off of uneaten food and waste from other tank mates. They're also fast to reproduce and can achieve sizable populations in a very short amount of time. A close relative to the brittle star are the serpent starfish from the genus Orpheothrix. This guy pictured is massive, probably a good 12 inches across, and is highly active once food is in the water. Now I personally think he's creepy as heck, but at the same time it's really cool to watch him track down pieces of food. Once his arms come in contact with a morsel, it quickly wraps it up like an anaconda and wrestles it into its mouth. I don't have footage of it here, but I've fed some pretty large pieces of fish, practically the size of his oral disc, and it's beyond weird to see his body swell up after swallowing it. Another class of echinoderms is called crinoidea. Uh, crinos is uh, lily-like. And so these are indeed the sea lilies and feather stars. And what you'd see with those that's different is that their arms are out and then their oral face is, uh, or their mouth is facing the outside instead of down on the rock. Many of them are sessile because they're attached to their substrate. You can see here as adults at least. Um, and so that upward facing mouth is the unique characteristic for that crinoidea group. Echinoidea, echino is the spiny again. These are going to be sea urchins, which I think most people know have these sp poisonous, in many cases, spines, uh, and also sand dollars, which we always see sand dollars. You're only seeing the um, endoskeleton of that sand dollar. And in fact, actually, they're covered with that thin skin. And then you can see all these little tube feet on here. Um, and so these guys have calcareous plates that are fused together versus the sea stars and such that are kind of more uh, flexible. Um, and that's what I mean by solid shell. They don't have arms, but they do have those tube feet. And then our last class is the holothoroidea. It doesn't actually mean this, but I just think of whole, and that helps me remember these have a, a circular mouth that is surrounded by the tube feet and they can help um, stuff food into their mouth. 
they are the sea cucumbers and uh, it might look like a slug to you but it has two feet on the bottom and that's how it moves along and also they have this rather unique characteristic that they can expel their guts through their anus if they are attacked and I'll show you a uh, video of that. The other non-chordate phylum in Deuterostomia is the hemichordata or acorn worms. And we don't talk about those too much, but they are deep sea dwellers, um, can be very, very long, and have some interesting characteristics that are sort of like a chordate, but not quite. Now do remember though that they are not most closely related to chordates. These guys are with the echinoderms, so the chordates are here. Hemichordates and echinoderms are there. So these two are sister phyla, and the chordates branched off before that. However, we do use hemichordata to see sort of transitional features between um, non-chordates and chordates. How's the ship doing? The ship is underway at 100. We have time noise. Yeah. Acorn worms are very <laughs> cool. I tried. Bean. Hard to tell where he ends though. Yeah. yeah. Way up here. Wow. You got that capture, Katie? Yeah, I got it. I'll go tighter. Sorry, I was a little fixing. Yeah, I think they're their own phylum. Uh, it was one of the uh, sea cucumber? I don't think so. Really? Yeah. Just what a weird ending to an animal. <laughs> yeah. it just like it just like gave up yeah, the rest done. of its body. <laughs> I'm done right here. I'm just looking well, at that's it all wondering. the filtering that they've been doing. That it's been doing. Do you yeah. think they're fil they're, they're processing yeah. all the way to the end there? Yeah, for a while. It's a impressive. Huh? Looks yeah. like he's just lounging on the rock. Like <laughs> that was all one he sitting. Stopped, was all, just like uh, <laughs> so much dirt <laughs> in my stomach. <laughs> Let's, let's go wide, Alex. You got it. So we get a can, close zoom. Uh, Sulak oh, yeah, has called in from time to time. USGS. I'm pretty sure it's from the fish I just picked up. Yeah. And just joining us right now is Liz Shea from the Delaware there. Museum of Natural History. And no doubt Liz is joining us to for, participate for the in, the mid, in the midwater mm -hmm. dive. Yes, in the midwater yeah. dive. Yep. Heading down. Wow. This is beautiful video yeah. of yeah. this worm. So please. Um, Stay, the the so. scientists, uh, shipboard, <laughs> or sorry, shore based science team, please stay on the line. We're going to uh, take a short break from the public uh, uh, video, sorry, audio broadcast and have our dive planning call for, for tomorrow's tomorrow. dive. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's great. Uh, okay, then just looking at our last group, the chordata phylum, um, we're just going to look at the very basic characteristics of those. All right, so I'm gonna draw a very generalized sketch of a chordate so I can show you the basic characteristics it has. Okay. All right, so this is at least seen in embryonic stages of all chordates. There are four major synapomorphies of the phylum chordata. These are not them, but I need to label to orient you. This part is the mouth, and here is the anus of this chordate. All right, one of the first features that we'll look at is the most dorsal feature. So just to also point out, this is the anterior, posterior, the dorsal, and the ventral sides of the organism. So on the very dorsal end, have this hollow tube here, which we call the dorsal hollow nerve cord. We'll see more detail about this in a moment. Now you'll notice this is dorsal. The other organisms we looked at, the animals like the grasshopper and crayfish, they had a ventral 
um, nerve cord. Now we have a dorsal nerve cord. Underneath that nerve cord, a little, uh, or ventral to it, we have this block of tissue, not hollow, and this one's called the notochord. That's where the name chordate comes from. That's number two. Number three is that, um, I draw it like this. So in this case, I'm showing it like uh, surrounding the digestive system or on one side, but we have these openings called pharyngeal slits or pharyngeal clefts. They turn into different things, and we'll see that in a moment, but um, they are the characteristic, the third characteristic of chordates. And finally, we have this region here, which is a muscular post-anal tail. And you can see the anus, and then this is posterior to it. This is different than something like the worms we've looked at, where their anus was actually at the very posterior of their body. So you will definitely need to know those four characteristics that define chordates. Looking at the notochord in more detail, you'll notice it's highlighted in red or pink in these pictures. So this one is a developing zebrafish. Um, and then this is like if we took the body and cut it this way and then looked at it from the end. So we're basically like looking at it from the head, but you've chopped it in half uh, from the anterior side, I should say. Uh, okay, so you'll notice that it runs anterior posterior, so from head to tail. And it is this uh, um, solid block of tissue. It says flexible rod. And you notice, as I drew before, it's going to be between the dorsal hollow nerve cord and then the gut. And you can see that very well here. So this is a mouse embryo. Here's a cut through of the mouse. So as if we took um, the mouse and cut it like this and then looked um, into it, like into the tube, if you will. So here's your notochord. There's the dorsal hollow nerve cord, and there's the gut tube. And so you can see that's right between it. In the embryos, it's used for skeletal support, and in some adult type of chordates, it's still used for that. Uh, at all of them, it's an important signaling center. So um, for brain development, for example, um, that's what comes from the hollow, dorsal hollow nerve cord. The uh, notochord produces um, different molecular signals that then cause the brain to turn into different parts depending on the strength of the signal that the um, dorsal hollow nerve cord gets. In most of the chordates, which are the vertebrates, um, the uh, notochord's function is basically replaced by the backbone. In the adult, but in all chordate embryos, we always see this notochord. The dorsal hollow nerve cord develops into the central nervous system, that's what CNS is, which in the end is the brain and spinal cord, the brain more anterior, and then the spinal cord running down the dorsal side of the animal. And you can see in this picture, the same one we saw with the notochord, but in this case, this is the dorsal hollow nerve cord right there. And you can see it actually forming in um, the folding of the dorsal tissue. So here it's a flat plate and there's the notochord. And you can see that basically it bends up and then rolls into a tube. And so there's the hollow part inside and that would be the dorsal hollow nerve cord. There's your notochord again. And when this uh, doesn't actually close all the way, we have problems in uh, like, like in humans. If you didn't have the uh, anterior part closed, then you have what we call anencephaly. Um, if we don't have the posterior part, then you have um, craniorachiostasis or something like spina bifida, and so this closing is important. And after the tube um, then undergoes more development, it's a more sophisticated brain and spinal cord features. The pharyngeal slits or clefts are grooves in the pharynx, um, which is part of the kind of throat region of the um, gut tube. 
And uh, one of the really amazing things about all chordates is that their embryos look very, very similar. And one of those features is those slits or clefts. So you can see that here in the human embryo, these features, those are the pharyngeal clefts. Here's a mouse embryo, and here's a bat embryo. And this is the anterior, the head, and the posterior is curled up down here for the bat. Uh, anterior and then posterior, and then anterior and posterior there. And so those slits turn into different things. These are actually all mammals, um, which are one of the groups in the chordata. Um, and they would be part of the tetrapod group. And so in these three organisms, you'd actually have those slits turning into parts of the ear, head, and neck. In many invertebrate chordates, and we'll see examples of those like tunicates and the cephalochordata lancelets, they're going to turn into suspension feeding structures. And in the non-tetrapod vertebrates, they are going to turn into gas exchange structures um, like gills, let's say, and those would be the types of fish we think about, so cartilaginous fish, hagfish, um, lampreys, uh, bony fish or rayfinned fish, the lobefin fish, um, and so forth. And then that muscular post-anal tail, obviously a tail posterior to the anus, uh, it is um, used for propelling in many aquatic species, so basically swimming, that muscular feature allows that. Many times it is reduced in the adult but you will see it in the embryo. For example, in the human embryo, even though we don't have it as um, adults, there's your muscular postanal tail. This is a limb bud. It's going to be the uh, legs in the human. So there's the little tail. Mice do develop the tail. Uh, it's behind this head, but it's over there. And then uh, bats do not develop their tail, but you can see that indeed they have a muscular postanal tail as embryos. In the next set of lectures, we're going to look at all these specific groups of the chordates. So here, these groups. Uh, I really like this um, phylogeny. It's important that you understand it and understand the clades as well as the subphyla or classes and the synapomorphies. Here's what we just talked about, those characteristics of chordates. Very, very strong evidence of common ancestry. I also really like this table as well. Um, same groups, the clades here give you a basic description, and then here are those synapomorphies um, in a sort of different format, showing you the different uh, larger groups that each of these groups belongs to. 